Of course, theology is the queen of academic sciences. But which discipline is the crown on the queen's head? There are some contenders. Sadly, church polity seems to be the underdog, and that's the second time today we hear about dogs. Should that be so? It's said that John Calvin didn't want those sharing his views to be called Calvinists. On the continent, many chose the name Reformed, emphasizing their doctrine and confession. Across the channel, the battles were less over doctrine and more over practice. Thus, some identified themselves as Presbyterians, characterizing themselves by their polity. So polity is important. Bad polity turns God's people off. Just check the second of Luther's 95 theses. Good polity attracts God's people, and reformed polity is good polity. Reformed church planters will tell a good governance and practice is as much, if not more, of an attractant than reformed doctrine. What makes reformed polity good from a practical perspective is the fact that it's presbyterial synodal. Presbyterial points out that the local church is governed by elders. That's in contrast with congregational. The local church is governed by the sum of the congregational members. Synodal points out that the churches together are governed by assemblies of local churches. That's in contrast with collegial, local churches being governed by regional, provincial, and or national boards. Presbyterial synodal indicates local churches and bonds of churches stand by each other so that all things are done decently and in good order. One can point out two aspects of reformed polity that show it maintains real gospel. First and foremost, it is normed by scripture, by the real gospel. And second, within the norms of scripture, it chooses ways and means to keep man's self-seeking pride in check and bring honor to God, bring to expression God's love and loyalty, his justice and mercy. Reformed polity is a system of governance in which no individual and no church domineers another, but where Christ is the only universal bishop, the only head of the church, the only master. The Synod of Dort marks an important milestone in the development of Reformed polity. It's my intention to foster appreciation for the heritage the Lord has granted us through Dort. I also hope to appetite, whet appetites for further study. And finally, I seek to alert us to some possible myths in regards to the polity of Dort. And I hope to do this by first acquainting us with the background to Dort polity. Then we'll look at some Dort specifics, and finally we'll consider how it performed. To understand well how Dort polity took its shape, we need to be aware of several contexts. The broader context is that of the Romanists and the Anabaptists. Over against the Romanists, the Reformed maintained the equality of all office bearers and Christ as the universal bishop and only head of the church. Over against Anabaptists, the Reformed maintained the need for lawfully ordained office bearers called by God through election by the congregation. The Dutch Reformed churches articulated their stance during the 1560s in the Belgic Confession. It was in the late 1560s and early 1570s that the Dutch Reformed began to shape their own polity. 
The narrower context is that of the Remonstrants or Armenians. I call it a narrower context because these two positions um, in this point of divergence, they were both within the Reformed churches. The Remonstrants favored a polity similar to that of the Lutherans. This polity is known as Erastianism after the Lutheran Thomas Erastus. It advocates a greater level of involvement by the state in the affairs of the church. The contra remonstrants pursued a polity that practiced a greater measure of independence between church and state. But probably not as much as we would like to consider proper today. A third context also needs to be in view, the social and political context. The five decades during which Dort polity took shape and the three decades that followed were a time of war. The population of the lowlands were divided culturally into two major language units. I don't think the Frisians counted yet. My mum's a Frisian, by the way. And these populations were divided over some 17 political units. And for the period that we're interested in, the Spanish were the overlords. And so the pursuit of independence was also with a view to practicing the reformed faith. The reality of the civil war frequently limited the ability of the reformed churches to assemble properly. And it also meant that the civil authorities were very leery of assemblies of people for non-civil purposes. And thus it is that the story of Dort polity does not actually begin on Dutch soil. Its deepest roots are hidden in a fog that historians have yet to disperse, and origins of sorts exist with John Calvin's ecclesiastical ordinances of 1541. There are also obvious influences from the Reformed churches in France, who organized in 1559. And where more specifically the organization of the local church is concerned, there are influences from the Dutch refugee churches. London in England, a Dutch language one and a French one. See, no Frisian. Frankenthal in the Palatinate and Emden in East Frisia. The French Reformed organized in 1559. The Scottish in 1560. The Hungarians in 1567. The Dutch Reformed Church is needed to as well. An initial meeting of predominantly ministers took place. Traditionally, it's thought that this meeting took place in the German town Wesel in the year 1568, though it's actually quite likely that it happened in the summer of 1571 in Emden. There's a dissertation on that. At this coming together, this convent, a church order of sorts, was drafted. In October 1571, the Dutch Reformed churches, to the extent that they were able, met in Emden. And here the Articles of Wesel were reviewed, they were revised, and they were adopted. 1574, a first major ecclesiastical assembly could be held on Dutch soil. Strictly speaking, a provincial synod. Dort 74 was attended by delegates from other provinces, and so it had somewhat of a national character. This synod again reviewed, revised the church order articles. And next came three truly national synods, Dort 78, Middleburg 81, and The Hague 86. Each reviewed and revised the church order. Between 86 and 1618, there was no national synod. The powers of the day feared unrest if a church assembly was called. Factor in the reality that the remonstrants were a minority in the reformed churches, yet favored more civil influence in church affairs, and thus had an in with the authorities. And it's not hard to see why national church life formally ground to a halt. Further, the civil authorities were themselves developing polity for the churches. That began in 1576. And in 1612, the states of Utrecht actually adopted and enforced a church order. In Utrecht, the remonstrants had the numbers. The civil authorities were encroaching on ecclesiastical territory, and in that process, were limiting 
ecclesiastical authority. So what are we talking here? Much could be mentioned and the extent to which civil authority sought influence, it varied from region to region. Note the following. First of all, the state sought in to influence the appointment of office bearers in the church. The state claimed the right of approbation. It wanted to be able to veto the ordination of ministers, elders, and deacons. Second, the state laid claim to the assets and finances of the churches. Stipends of church ministers were to be caught, paid by the states. And that's dangerous. For the one who pays the pipers, piper calls the tune. The states sought involvement in the exercise of church discipline. You see, the civil servants had to be members of the Reformed Church. And so a civil servant who was excommunicated would also be out of a job. And the state resisted the involvement of the church in state affairs. The civil authorities in the lowlands wanted to create a nation of religious tolerance. While the reformed churches, as per Belgian Confession Article 36, sought the advancement of the reformed churches at the expense of the other churches. Now, while the Synod of Dort was assembled primarily with a view to the remonstrance, other matters were also addressed by the Synod. And on May 13, 1619, the Synod decided to review the canons of the last Synod. The canons of the last Synod. That was the church order of 1586. The articles were duly reviewed. A list of topics that required attention was drafted. The relationship between church and state featured very prominently on that list. I've listed the matters that were touched on on the screen. And some of these are now going to have our attention as we consider some specifics of Dort polity. The Reformed Church has confessed. We believe that although it is useful and good for those who govern the church to establish a certain order to maintain the body of the church, they must at all times watch that they do not deviate from what Christ, our only master, has commanded. That articulates the sola scriptura principle, scripture alone. Church governance and practice has to be within the bounds of scripture. It does what Christ commands, it rejects what Christ forbids. Do things decently and in order, for God is a God of peace. 1 Corinthians 14. God's old covenant people received a church order through Moses. The New Testament church received the Holy Spirit. So with Pentecost, the church, one might say, came of age. And thus the church has been given freedom. What is now the role of the congregation? What should be sung during worship? What exactly is the authority of a major assembly? The reformers recognized that much had been left by Christ himself to the church. And thus the confession spoke of it being useful and good to establish a certain order. Hence the reformed church is allowed for differences in practice in minor points of church order and worship. Originally, that phrase referred to differences in practices between local churches within a bond of churches. For some time, it was even the final remark at the end of the church order. Today, it tends to be found in the article on churches abroad. To quote our own, on minor points of church order and ecclesiastical practice, churches abroad shall not be rejected. And thus, a second guiding principle. Where there is freedom within the bounds of scripture, Governance and practice are shaped by what is culturally pleasing and circumstantially possible. For example, the Dort Church Order stipulated that ministers are to preside consistory meetings. In the Canadian Reformed Churches, that's been softened with an as a rule. But a recent check within the CANRC finds 
that 60% of the ministers do not preside all the consistory meetings. Some just consistory, some just consistory with deacons, and some, myself included, none at all. The times have changed. I turn to a next specific. I'll ask my catechism students, this is a slide from one of my lessons, is the church a democracy? And they're never sure. On the one hand, they realize that there are office bearers who govern the church, and on the other hand, well, we have elections. The truth is, of course, the church is a Christocracy. Christ is the only head. And it's pleased our Lord to govern his church through the special offices with the congregation as communion of royal priests proclaiming God's word, providing balance. And thus the Reformed Church has confessed, we believe that there should be ministers or pastors, elders and deacons. And they confessed, we believe that they ought to be chosen to their offices by lawful election of the church. Now the roles of the office bearers and congregation are different. In Dort polity, the special offices have authority. They form ecclesiastical assemblies with jurisdiction. There's no description in the Dort church order of the so-called congregational meeting. Indeed, in Dort polity, a congregational meeting is actually a meeting of the consistory with the deacons to which the congregation has been invited and at which congregational members may voice an opinion. And thus, too, under Dort polity, a local church is not what in the Canadian legal context would be considered a society. The special offices have authority. The congregation has a voice. The principles were clear. However, some of the details were not. For example, the process for electing office bearers, where the influence, especially of the London church, was felt, the congregation was more directly involved where the influence of especially the French and Flemish churches was felt, the consistory was more directly involved. And here, Dort actually allowed wriggle room. It was a minor point of church governance. It was with the revisions of the church order in 1905 in the Netherlands and 1914 in North America that things became confused, in part because of democratic tendencies. Even more so when in 1983 the Canadian Reformed adopted formulations which turned the voice of the congregation from advisory under Dort polity to authoritative under Dolianci polity. That's where our women voting discussion comes from. The next specific I want to turn to is worship. Another section in the Dort Church Order. The Synod of Dort noted that full uniformity of practice was not required. However, in some areas, greater uniformity was considered wise. Two things. First of all, Bible translations. It's rather curious that the Dort Church Order has no article on Bible translations when it does have one on songs. Of course, the two are not quite the same thing. For while there are many songs to choose from, you don't diminish or enlarge scriptures. Your confession already lists the 66 books. However, there were many Bible translations the Dutch could choose from. So why no guideline? Well, we've heard one of the first things the Synod of Dort did was to commission a new translation of the scriptures. 1611, the King James Version had been published and the Dutch had seen the benefits of this undertaking. They'd also learned a lesson. It's wiser to start from scratch than to revise something existing. 
And so the Synod, in the course of November 1618, mandated the translation of the scriptures from the original languages. And this, so the Acts tell us, was to be the translation to be used in the churches. My impression is that as Dort had already made this decision, it didn't need to consider it necessary to specify in the church order what Bible translation should be used. In hindsight, it would have made sense for Synod to have said something like, the translation approved by Synod shall be used in the churches. Now, it didn't make such a generic statement regarding the songs either. Hence, the adopted regulation is very specific. All the songs being referenced by name. In doing so, it, by implication, created two categories of songs, the compulsory and the free. The first category consisted of the 150 Psalms of David, the six named hymns. And of the six, five were rhymed versions of scripture. The sixth was the Apostles' Creed. And then it was left in the freedom of the churches whether to use a seventh named hymn, a free hymn. All other hymns that was decided had to be warded off. And that article thus brings to expression on the one hand the principle of singing scripture. On the other hand, it was understood that there is legitimacy for freedom among the churches. And then again, the synod did set limits to that freedom. Seems to me the Reformed churches were not really done with this issue in 1619. A next specific. Titus 1 verse 9 stipulates that an elder must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Ensuring this by having preachers and teachers sign a creed dates back all the way to the Council of Nicaea, the first council to adopt a creed. Vasil and Emden speak of being bound to the confession. Dort, 1574, first prescribed the signing of the confession directly. Subsequent to this synod, subsequent to the synod, Classes Walcheren adopted a form of subscription to spell out the import of the signature. It's the oldest form for subscription in the Dutch language that I know of. Use of that form then fell into disuse. But as the debate between the remonstrance and the contra-remonstrance heated up, the use of a form resurfaced. Some classes and provincial synods used the form to specify what exactly subscribing a confession meant so that they could hold the signatories accountable. For one of the distinctions between the remonstrance and the contra remonstrance was how to see the authority of confessional documents. Remonstrance tended to emphasize their human authorship and thus minimize their authority. Contra remonstrants tended to emphasize their concordance with scripture and thus emphasize their authority. At Dort, the contra remonstrant position was articulated in the adopted form for subscription. We, from the heart, consider and believe that all the articles and points of doctrine of the confessions agree in everything with the word of God. Now that sounds extreme. Was the Synod of Dort confessionalist? Did it ignore its own confession? We may not consider any writings of men of equal value with the divine scriptures, nor ought we to consider councils, decrees, or statutes as of equal value with the word of God. No, it did not. That became clear when the delegates from Overijssel submitted their credential. In that credential, one could read that the members of Dort shall judge according to the word of God and the analogy of faith in the Belgian Confession and Heidelberg Catechism. Hmm. Was Overijssel not elevating the confessions to the level of scripture? The delegates from Overijssel were asked to clarify. <laughs> 
and they agreed. One judges by God's word alone. Avoiding the impression of being confessionalist seems to have been a factor in how the synod formulated things, and no doubt the instruction from the states also played into this. The canons of Dort are devoid of references to the confessional documents the Reformed churches had already adopted. Further, Article 31 of the church order indicated that all decisions of synods were to be considered settled and binding unless they were at odds with scripture or the church order. Note, the confessions are not mentioned. It is only via the form of subscription that the confessions actually come into view. And there, very specifically, as having authority only because of their agreement with God's word. A last specific. In the early 20th century, a fierce polity battle was fought in the Netherlands and North America. It began when a general synod deposed a minister for heresy. While the vast majority agreed the minister deserved deposition, a sizable minority disputed the right of a broader assembly to do this. The minority argued deposition is something a consistory decides to, while the majority argued broader assemblies can depose as well. The minority designated their position old polity and the practiced position new polity. The majority challenged these designations, arguing that the old was actually new and that the new was old. Now, since old polity was clearly the polity of the 1886 churchism known as the Doliancy, scholars today will generally refer to it as Doliancy polity. And while advocates of Doliancy polity and so-called new polity disagree on which polity is true to Dort, both are agreed on where they differ, and on the fact that there was a shift in polity practice in the early 20th century. That shift is noticeable as one goes from one edition of the church order commentaries to another. It just so happens to be that generally the ones that are colored in red binding are the older version, the Dolianzi version, and the ones in blue tend to be what was termed new polity. Now, what intrigues me about this debate is that advocates of synodical polity or new polity appealed, among others, to Westminster polity, practiced by Presbyterianism. They did that to justify their position as being within the bounds of Scripture. That was done, among others, by Dr. H. H. Cowper. That's interesting, and because in doing so, he took a position opposite to that of his father, Dr. Abram Cowper who had written that Presbyterian polity was a capital mistake and hierarchical. At the same time, those who practice Dolianzi polity seem to consider the choice between Westminster or Dolianzi polity today to be a minor point. For Presbyterian and Reformed churches do enjoy ecclesiastical fellowship. Now, this debate led to a dissertation on the subject Vutsius on the authority of broader assemblies. Now here's something intriguing. Gisbertus Vutsius was one of the youngest delegates at the Synod of Dort. Subsequent to the Synod of Dort, he wrote a book on church polity, and he's considered to be the father of Dort polity. His book, Politica Ecclesiastica, was written in Latin. Some sections have been translated into Dutch. To the best of my knowledge, very little, if anything, has been translated into English. Now, such an English translation would be helpful, for then one could do a comparison of Vutsius' work with a contemporary standard Presbyterian work, Rex Lex, by Samuel Rutherford. Rutherford was a member of the Westminster Assembly some 30 years after the Synod of Dort. And Rutherford is a father of Presbyterian polity. And Vutsius and Rutherford knew each other. Indeed, apparently Vutsius invited Rutherford to come and teach in Utrecht. Now that's intriguing. 
If Dort polity considered the authority of broader assemblies to be derived rather than direct, as Dolianzi polity argues, and contra the argument of Westminster polity, would Vucius not have interacted with Rutherford on that issue? So I sense there's research to be done here. And given that in North America the worlds of Westminster and Dort polities meet, what better place than our continent to do that research? I want to share with you two specifics from Dort that suggest original Dort polity was actually quite similar to Westminster polity. Not the same, but similar. One of the questions of review regarded the position of ministers in a classis. Question was, if a church is served by more than one minister and all its ministers come to the classes, does just one minister have a vote? And are the other members advisories? Or do all the ministers have a vote? Dort said, all the ministers vote. And it is true, historically, ministers have dominated classes, not only because of their education, but also simply because of their numbers. The Synod of Dort also adopted two church order articles on subscription and forms outlining the process. Ministers were to sign the form in a classis. The church order indicated that ministers who refused to subscribe would be suspended by the consistory or classis. And if they persisted, would be deposed. That explains why the last line of the form for subscription adopted by Dort reads, reserving the right of appeal if we should believe that we have been grieved, during which appeal we will acquiesce in the judgment and determination of the provincial synod. No mention is made of the judgment and determination of the classes or the consistory. And that suggests that an initial judgment is considered to come from either consistory or classes, that a provincial synod is the first court of appeal, and the national synod is the final court of appeal. Now, I'm not arguing the rights and wrongs here. My point is that original Dort polity did contain elements that flow from what Presbyterians term connectionalism. That said, my opinion is no secret. You may have noticed, for example, I've consistently spoken of joined churches as a bond rather than a federation. Whence then the aversion of Dolianzi polity to Presbyterian polity? Well, given my research, my sense is that Abram Kuyper and F.L. Rutgers, the fathers of Dolianzi polity, were actually influenced by social contract theory of their day. I want to leave it there, but I'm sure you'll appreciate there's unfinished business here. Turn finally and briefly to the performance of Dort polity once it was in place. Remember, one of the issues of the day was the exact relationship between the church and state. While aspects of that issue were settled, not all of it. A form of patronage continued. The relationship with churches abroad also had to involve civil authorities. And following the Synod of Dort, the national and provincial governments blocked the full implementation of the Church Order of Dort. Adapted versions of the Church Order were adopted, or the implementation of certain provisions were stayed. The national government prevented the convening of a national synod, and for the next two centuries, there was none. Provincial synods were often hindered. Doctrinal discipline was rarely exercised, and when it was, I've studied every case between 1619 and 1750 for my masters. I think there were four. When it was, government interference prevented the full execution of ecclesiastical justice. And so in 1795, the Republic of the Lowlands became the Batavian Republic, and church and state were separated. The Reformed churches could now fully operate under the Church Order of Dort. But under pressure from France, 
Politically, things were changing so fast that the churches could not get their act in order. It had, indeed, it seems even few knew what Dort had been all about. Political stability had returned by 1815, but in 1816, a collegial system of polity was imposed upon the Reformed churches by the state, and the freedom of the churches was curtailed. In 1834 and 35, over 100 churches seceded from the main Reformed Church for reasons of doctrine, governance, and practice. At the first synod in 1836, they decided to operate under Dort. A year later, some of the seceders adopted another church order, the Church Order of Utrecht. Discussions on which polity to follow divided them for the next three years. 1840, most decided to go back to the Church Order of Dort. However, the decision to apply for recognition by the states did not sit well with some. They continued on their own. In 1869, that battle axe was buried. The Church Order of Dort was fully adopted, but with a preamble for the sake of state recognition. Then in 1886, a second schism in the main Reformed Church occurred. The churches that came out of that formed a temporary bond of churches under the Church Order of Dort. They were eager to unite with the seceders, but that preamble had to go. 1891, the preamble was repealed by the seceders. In 1892, the union under the Church Order of Dort became a fact. I should note that by this time, the Church Order of Dort was already operative in other Dutch immigrant churches. The Christian Reformed Churches in North America and the Reformed Churches in Southern Africa also practiced Dort, as did, by the way, various groups of Reformed congregations in the Netherlands and North America. And there's research to be done there as well, because it's interesting to see how the polities developed in different lingual cultural contexts. I end it there. For following the revision of the Dort Church Order in 1905, 1914, and 1916, the story is actually not that of Dort polity, but of Doliancy polity. In closing, the polity of Dort is some 400 years old, 399 if you consider 1619 to be its birth year, but 450 if the convent of Wesel was indeed in 1568. It was a serious effort to maintain real gospel in ecclesiastical governance and practice. Dort polity is also an ongoing project. Scripture presents us with guidelines, with some major do's and don'ts, but much of ecclesiastical governance is shaped by culture and circumstance. I wonder, for example, how Dort polity should function in our common law context instead of the stated law context of Europe. And of course, there's the question, do the polities of Presbyterians and the Reformed really need to be that different? If we today had to develop a polity maintaining real gospel, what would it look like? Be that as it may, I'm convinced we should be appreciative of our Dort heritage, not only where Tulip is concerned, also where our polity is concerned, for it is real gospel. And again, our governance and practice is much appreciated. And as such, I commend our seminary for continuing to allow church polity a solid place among the disciplines of theology. It might be the underdog, but it is in the picture of Dort. But you've got to realize, ecclesiastical governance and practice is where the rubber of doctrine hits the road of life. Thank you.